I'd like to take a detailed look at the harmonic writing in des airs and how it functions. Now that's a somewhat perilous thing to do because as I've tried to make clear earlier, it's very difficult in Varese to abstract out one parameter and look at it at the exclusion of all the others. So for example, these chords and these harmonies that we're going to look at, uh, they really only make sense in relation to their instrumentation, to their dynamics, uh, and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, there are aspects of the, of the harmony that um, if you analyze them closely, start to make sense and you can start to understand how this music functions from a harmonic point of view. It's not always easy and it's clear also that there isn't any particular master plan or if there is one I, I can't really discern it myself uh, in terms of how the the overall rules of this harmony function. However, on a more local scale it's certainly possible to look at the harmonies and, and figure out how they work and how they were constructed. So one obvious characteristic of Désert from a harmonic point of view is that it tends to be fairly static and it ha tends to have a very slow harmonic rhythm. So what that means is that Varese will stay on a single chord for multiple bars. In, in fact, in the case of the, the beginning of the work, he stays on the same chord for 20 bars. So that's an interesting thing musically and the effect of it is that if you have one parameter of sound that is static or that is relatively simple, then you need to make sure that the other parameters are fantastically interesting so that the listener doesn't get bored. And that's exactly what Varese does, and he's very good at this. So, for example, here we have this, this static six-note chord. Well, it eventually opens up and turns into a, a nine-note uh, field of pitches, but Basically, these, these notes are static, they don't change register, they don't really move, and we stay on them for quite a long time. But to compensate for that, he has this extraordinarily interesting orchestration, and he is constantly investigating the inner life of this chord in a very interesting way. So we looked at that earlier when I talked about the orchestration at the beginning of the piece. So just to go over the, the some of the main tools, the main harmonic tools and procedures that Varese uses in this piece. Um, I'd like to just go over the list here. There's, there's a, a fairly limited number of things that he does. One of them is that he uses mirror chords. So mirror chords basically are chords in which you have two halves, an upper half and a lower half, and the lower half is the mirror image of the upper half. In other words, you, if you're counting the intervals from bottom to top, you'll find the same sequence of intervals in the bottom half of the chord, but in reverse order. So we'll have a look at that more specifically in a minute. These uh, mirror chords tend to be orchestrated in a very elaborate manner, and they tend to have uh, a great deal of interest in terms of the, the way timbre is deployed in them. On the, on the other hand, you also have these what I call fanfares, and these fanfares are relatively short declamatory bursts that are associated with the brass for the most part, and you'll get these brass instruments declaring these sort of two-note dyads, these, these uh, little uh, two-note sequences, and they sort of pile up on top of each other like a massive traffic jam, and you get these very complex textures coming out of that. And these are clearly gestures that refer to things outside of just the closed world of the piece. There's a, there's a rhetorical function to them. They, they certainly call to mind the, the brass writing of a lot of great symphonies, and, and uh, so they're not, these are not simply neutral sound for the sake of sound elements. They have a force, they have a dramaturgy to them. Now the next thing on, on this list here is that you have very short little melodic fragments. There's very few of them in Des Airs, actually. The, the texture of this piece, generally speaking, is, is harmonic, and there's, there's very little of what you would call conventional melody, or even, even fragments of melody, really. And the textures are not contrapuntal in this piece. They really are harmonic. But when you do get these little short melodic episodes, they're striking because they're sort of unusual in the context of the work as a whole. And I've noticed that these short melodic fragments use the octatonic scale, and we will have a look at that also in a minute. The other thing is there are a few short episodes of the piece in which Varese 
uses octave doublings in a very interesting way, where he'll have uh, a note doubled in three different octaves, for example, to have a, a sudden change of texture. And that is used certainly for its harmonic effect, and um, it, it tends to be fairly brief when it does happen, but it's very striking. The effect is very striking compared to the more chromatic uh, textures in this piece. In a few spots of the piece, he uses complementary hexachords, and that is a complicated way of saying that he uses two six-note chords, where if you add up all the notes in the two six-note chords, you end up with the total, uh, the total chromatic, in other words, all 12 semitones of the chromatic scale. And to finish, uh, there are also a number of sections of the piece that use 12-note fixed pitch fields, and so what that means is that he'll take all the all the 12 um, chromatic semitones, and he'll put each one in a specific octave, in a specific register, and keep it there so it doesn't move. It's completely static. So you have this you have this sort of note field that is harmonically static, and within that, he will take each individual note and modulate it dynamically so that the the intensity, the loudness varies continually. And he'll do that with, with each note independently. There's a few episodes like this in, in Désert. And again, it's a way of taking one parameter that may be simple or static and then animating it through timbre or animating it through dynamics or, or through rhythm. So let's just have a, a, an overview now of, of, uh, of the harmony in the piece. So as I mentioned earlier, the piece starts off with this mirror chord. And it's a it's a completely diatonic chord. In other words, it only, use, it only uses the white notes of the piano. And if we look at the upper half, we see a series of stacked perfect fifths. So F, C, and G. And then the bottom half, reading from top to bottom, is E, A, and D. So that's maybe not the best example of a mirror chord because it only actually contains one interval, the perfect fifth. And we have two chords made up of, made up of perfect fifths and they're separated by a minor ninth between the E at the top of the lower chord and the F at the bottom of the upper chord. Now, um, after this chord is gradually introduced, note by note, uh, you get initially just the F and the G in the upper part, and then it, it gradually fills in and the harmonic space becomes richer and, and more full. He eventually introduces a C sharp in the middle, so this is in the middle, sort of between the two halves of the mirror chord, and this is a very important note. I've got it marked in red here because this middle voice, this middle register note, sort of climbs upwards uh, chromatically, step by step, until it reaches a G, a tritone above. So we'll have a look at that in a second. Moving on, the next major note uh, aggregate or chord or whatever you would like to call it uh, occurs in bar 21. So this means that we've spent 20 bars on a single chord. Now in 20, bar 21 we have another mirror chord. Uh, this one's a little bit easier to, to grasp because it has more than one interval. So reading it from top to bottom we see E to B flat, so that's a tritone, B flat to E flat, so that's a perfect fifth, Okay, so that's the upper half of the mirror chord. Now the bottom half is E to D, so that's a perfect fifth, and then D to G, which is a tritone. So it's the same interval sequence, but in reverse order. So that makes it a classic uh, mirror chord. Now, interestingly, uh, Varese is not, uh, is not sticking to any kind of uh, dodecophonic or, or serial or atonal rigor in particular in the way that he uses his harmonies. So unlike what would happen in, in, in Weber and of any period or, or Schoenberg, he doesn't he does allow himself to use octave doublings rather freely and to take pitches and and displace them into different registers, which is a very interesting effect. It works actually very, very well in this piece. So for example, in the event of this particular mirror chord, he takes the bottom three notes and transposes them down an octave, and in fact the A in the sort of middle of this mirror chord appears in three different octaves throughout this section. So it's actually, it's very subtle. You do get a sense of, of, uh, of a note sort of changing function and changing identity by being shifted from one octave to another, while still remaining in the same basic harmonic world. <laughs> 
Now we can also see in this bar that that middle voice I spoke to earlier that I've got written in red is now climbing upwards semi semitone by semitone. And that's an interesting thing. You don't necessarily perceive it when you're listening to the piece, but it does it does nevertheless affect our perception in an oblique manner because you have a sense of something gradually climbing upwards. It's very, very subtle. But if you analyze the way this piece works harmonically, you can see that it's clearly done by design. It's not an accident that this voice is, is climbing up. So all of this is done very, very carefully. Now, just as a side note, I would like to quickly point out that unfortunately, um, Désert is one of the worst engraved scores I have ever seen. The, the engraving job of the, of the score that's, com that's commercially for sale is, is horrible. It makes it very, very hard to read, and I'm, I'm sure that it's full of mistakes. So um, it's quite possible that one day there will be an authoritative edition of Désert, and it'll turn out that there are actually wrong notes in it, and these will be corrected. So um, we have to take this uh, harmonic analysis with something of a grain of salt. I'm sure that I'm sure that the pitches are generally correct, but there may it's possible that there may be one or two that are that are in fact wrong notes or that the, that are mistakes in the in the uh, edition. But that doesn't stop us from understanding basically how the piece works. So we have a um, a very brief little transitional episode involving three held notes in the piano. And we have a second fanfare, which is different from the first in that it has a sense of harmonic motion in it. So it's not just a static chord. This is a, a sort of a sequence of chords that gradually rises upwards chromatically. And if you look at the top voice, we're rising up stepwise from F sharp to G to G sharp. So again, it's very carefully planned. Um, and this particular sequence also is interesting because it, it completes the rising middle voice that we mentioned earlier, which rises up a, 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 a tritone from C sharp to G. And once this procedure is finished, once we've sort of gotten to the, the end point of that rising figure, something very interesting happens because at this point the harmony is fairly full and we've basically occupied the full register of, of Verez's orchestra. So we've heard very low notes, we've heard very high notes, and the harmony is pretty full. Now at this point we have a fairly extended section of about six bars, starting in bar 34, where suddenly the harmony opens up and there's just a, a hollow spot in the middle. We only have very high notes and very low notes, and it, so it's very highly polarized. And he gives the very high notes to the E-flat clarinet and the piccolo. And this is a, a very a very striking moment in the piece. The piccolo plays a very high G, so that's the highest pitch that we've heard so far. And again, it's clear that all of this has been designed with, with great care. He is very, very careful about the overall ambitus, the overall register of the harmonies that he's using, the, ex the extreme high and extreme low notes, and the overall trajectory that they that they follow. So it's, it's clear that he is planning this in terms of a gradual progression, in terms of the overall level of, it, of tension that these harmonies contain. So let's have a look at the next sequence of the piece. One of the interesting things about Varese's harmonic language is that he's very sensitive to the rate at which harmonies change, to the harmonic rhythm. And it's very interesting that in the beginning of Désert, he has, again, a very slow harmonic rhythm. He spends 20 bars on a single chord. And I think part of the reason for that is that when you are first listening to a piece, it takes time to enter into the sound world, and it takes time to absorb the sort of language that the composer is, 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 is speaking in. And so you tend to have to go a little bit more slowly at the beginning, and then gradually you can start to go a little bit faster. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in Désert. So the first 40 bars were, were very very harmonically slow. We just had a handful of chords basically, and now at this point things start to get more complex and the harmonies start to change more rapidly. So now we have a gigantic 12-note mirror chord in bar 41, a uh, very very complex object sonically. So again we have the exact same interval sequence in the two halves of the chord and they are mirrored. Now, this is a 12-note field. It contains all 12 semitones, each of which is, is fixed in its own octave. And this is a little episode of the piece in which 
uh, Varese um, examines this static object and again animates it by means of timbre changes and dynamic changes and so on. Following this, we have a very short little melodic sequence, a little transition, if you like. And again, here it's interesting to see that despite the apparent abstraction of this music, there are actually all sorts of functions that are derived, or at least familiar, from earlier music. And you have things like transitions between sections, and you do have uh, overall uh, movement and direction in the harmony, even if it's sometimes only on a local scale. So in this transition, we have actually a seven-note octatonic scale. If you actually pull these notes apart and, and look at the intervals, um, we see that we have a scale that starts on, on the low F at the end of the bar, and then we go up to a G. Now there's an A-flat. We don't hear the A-flat right away. We hear it about ten bars later, but nevertheless it's part of the same structure. So F, G, A-flat, and then B-flat, and then B-natural, C sharp and D. So, in other words, an, a regular alternation of semitones and whole tones. And this is used melodically. It's not a harmonic object. And that's basically the first time that this has happened so far in the piece. From bars 47 to 49, we have an interesting sequence of octave doublings. It's, again, very, very striking. It's a completely new texture in the piece. And I think this points to something very, very interesting about Varese, which is that, again, he has no particular ideology that he is trying to uh, he's trying to defend through his music there is no there is no particular strictness in terms of what he can and can't do in the harmony there's a consistency to the language it's beautifully handled but you don't have that that polemical insistence on having an absolutely rigorous logic to all sections of the piece so he freely uses octave doublings and when they do occur they are very sonically striking and very effective that gets particularly interesting in bars 50 to 58, where we have actually a very sophisticated structure here. So we have a three-note chord in the bass and a two-note chord in the upper voice. And the two-note chord in the upper voice is interesting because we have these uh, this exchange where the upper note D uh, sort of slides chromatically upwards to E flat, and the lower note E flat slides down to a D, so we have this this exchange of the two voices, and it's uh, it's beautifully handled in the orchestration as well with uh, with xylophones and and uh, and uh, and glockenspiel. It's very very it's a very very striking moment in the piece. So what this is is basically a five note chord in which the the pitches can move around from one octave to another, and this episode is bisected by a brief return of the seven-note octatonic scale I mentioned earlier. So a very, very short little melodic transition. And then we hear the second part of this sequence. And again, it's, it's ingeniously done. It's ingeniously uh, structured in the sense that we have the mirror image of the chord that we heard previously. So if we look at the bass note, sorry, the bass clef here in the, in the earlier part, uh, so at bar 50, we see, uh, reading from bottom to top, E, D flat, F. And when this chord returns, a few bars later, we have the same interval sequence but, but reversed. So from bottom to top, we have A, C sharp, B flat. So the same interval sequence but in the opposite order. And the upper voices here in the, in the treble staff, we have F natural and E natural. And so if we take those four semitones together, the E flat D that we heard at the beginning, and then the E natural and F natural, then that is simply a four note segment of the chromatic scale. So all of this is done with an incredible sophistication. Now in bar 59, we have a seven note pitch field. And here I have to confess that I, I'm not able to determine exactly how uh, each one of these chords is constructed, and, and I'm not able to explain every single pitch. There is a consistency to the harmonic language that is that is absolutely certain, and we, we certainly see uh, a fairly limited repertoire of, uh, of different harmonic configurations, and, and this one is certainly consistent in which, in the sense that we have we have a similar structure to the earlier mirror chord. This is not exactly a mirror chord, but we have basically the same intervals, the familiar tritones, major sevenths, and, and, and major thirds that are present throughout this work. Um, it's probably possible to, to explain the construction of, of 
these chords in a more precise way than I'm doing. Um, perhaps if I had access to the composer's original sketches, I would have uh, even more insights into it. But I, th I think it's possible to deduce a lot of things just by studying the score. In bars 60 to 62, we have another 12 note pitch field, so a static field in which the composer will take individual pitches, give them to different instruments, and vary them in terms of their intensity. Now again here, it's it's not particularly clear how he constructs these 12 note pitch fields, uh, what the logic is behind them. Um, in this one you have much closer interval spacing, there's a lot of minor thirds and major seconds. I presume that that's for, uh, for the purposes of creating a harmonic effect of greater tension, but again uh, it's not always possible for me to determine the precise rationale between every pitch choice in this piece. In bar 63, we now have a very, very interesting passage. We have a series of two mirror chords that are, in fact, complementary hexachords. So I explained this earlier, this principle, which is simply that you have two chords where when you add up all the pitches, you, you end up with a complete chromatic series with no notes repeated. So if we look at the, the first hexachord here, reading it from bottom to top, we have F, D, F sharp. And then if we look at the lower half of the chord, we have E, G, E flat. So the upper chord has the interval sequence F to D, so that's a major sixth, and then D to F sharp, that's a major third. And the lower part has a major sixth, again, followed by a major third in, in, the, in the opposite direction. So another classic mirror chord. And you can see that in the, in the second chord, the chord that, that follows this one, the the mirror chord that we heard earlier is itself mirrored, so it's it's flipped around in the other direction. So the upper chord has first a major third and then a major sixth, whereas before it was it was the opposite sequence, and the lower chord has a major third and then a major sixth going from, from top to bottom. So incredibly ingenious construction here. And one of the interesting properties of mirror chords is that they they don't take into consideration the sort of basic laws of, uh, of acoustics, which is that, generally speaking, you tend to have chords that are more open in their spacing in the low register, and then as you climb up into the higher register, the notes get closer and closer together, which basically uh, is a reflection of the way the, the harmonic series functions, and the way natural acoustics and natural vibrating strings function, which is that the, the lower partials are, are spaced out, and then the higher ones get closer and closer together. And mirror chords absolutely do not take that into account. Their structure is completely unharmonic, in a sense, because you have this, this uh, distribution of, of intervals that is, is actually basically homogeneous. So you, you have the same types of intervals and the same types of spacings in the low register that, that you have in the high register. So they're very, very peculiar objects from a harmonic point of view, and Varese certainly treats them and orchestrates them with tremendous care. Now in bars 64 and 65, we have another 12-pitch field, and this one is considerably lower in pitch, generally speaking, than the one we heard previously. So again, I think that we have to look at these pitch fields for their their qualities as sound aggregates, so don't certainly don't look for harmonic functions in them. That's not what they are at all. These are these are fields. We don't even really necessarily hear them as chords. We hear them as a bunch of notes placed in different registers. They're not all playing at the same time necessarily. Um, some of these notes might be only heard once or very briefly, and so uh, the the texture and the density and the spacing is is constantly varied in function of the number of pitches of this field that are that are being heard simultaneously. So the way to really look at it, I think, is in terms of the density of the chord, how closely spaced the notes are, what register it occupies, and what some of the more characteristic intervals are within the chord. So as we move on, there's just one uh, quick point I want to make, which is that um, I'm looking at the first instrumental section of the piece, so the first sequence of just instruments, and after uh, bar 82 we have the first uh, appearance of the taped sounds that are an important feature of this piece. This piece contains four instrumental sections and three sections involving the use of, uh, of tape. And one of the reasons that I wanted to look at 
this particular section, so the first 82 bars of the piece, is that it's one of the sections that uses percussion instruments the least. So it conveniently allows me to focus on harmony because the, the percussion is not a particularly important part in this point of the piece. So obviously when we're doing a harmonic analysis, uh, I have to leave things like percussion out of the equation, which is really unfortunate because the percussion writing in this piece is absolutely remarkable. It's very, very sophisticated and it has all sorts of ingenious use of, of rhythm. So so this, this first section of the piece lends itself perhaps more to harmonic analysis because of its fundamentally harmonic character and the fact that the percussion instruments that are used are mostly pitched percussion, so things like uh, uh, like glockenspiel, uh, xylophone, uh, uh, timpani, and so on. So this uh, chord here in bar 71 is an interesting uh, example of Varese's technique of building chords by superimposing the same interval on itself multiple times. Now we saw that at the very beginning of the piece with the mirror chord that simply used a stack of perfect fifths. Now there's, there's a lot of chords in this piece, particularly in the fanfare sections, where uh, Varese alternates perfect fourths and augmented fourths and that is a relatively straightforward way of creating a chromatic texture without any repeated pitches in the chord. So here it's just a, a sequence of superimposed minor ninth chords. They're not stacked vertically on top of each other, they are staggered, so we get a rather complex um, acoustic object here. But again, basically it amounts to uh, uh, an alternation of, of augmented fourths and, and perfect fourths and perfect fifths. We follow this with the fifth fanfare, and this one is interesting because it contains multiple octave doublings, so again that's a rather uh, new texture for the piece in terms of the, the fanfare writing. And here we have the pitch D sharp that appears three times, so that very 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 low bass note there in the lower staff is a D sharp, and then you see it an octave above that, and again an octave above that. So the same pitch appears three times. And then we also have three appearances of G sharp in three different octaves. So again, a very, very striking texture when it appears. And it, it sounds somewhat like a simplification from a harmonic point of view when you hear this. And Varese is actually very sensitive to that. And the, the little, very short melodic sequences that we saw earlier that tend to appear in the transitional sections of the piece are, are ingenious, actually, because they result in a momentary simplification and thinning out of the texture, which you do need from time to time, because this music certainly has its declamatory and strident passages, and you could not really keep that up for very long without needing to um, sort of lighten up the texture from time to time, just to, to prevent the listener from, from becoming fatigued. So there's a constant alternation of uh, very complex acoustic objects and relatively simple ones in this piece, and it's very, very effective. So following this fanfare with the interesting octave doublings, we have a 10-pitch field and a, a rather interestingly spaced chord, again, because he has relatively closely spaced notes at the bottom of the chord, and then they, they get more open as we go up, so it's kind of a, an upside-down chord in an interesting way. Now, the, this first instrumental sequence of the piece ends in, a, again, a very, very interesting way. Another example of his, his use of this sort of mirroring technique. And if we look at the sequence of intervals in the upper staff, these are, these are heard in the brass, and they are heard as two-note chords. And what it is, basically, is he is he is opening up the interval size from a minor third, so we start with a D-sharp and F-sharp in bar 79 here. Then it opens up to a, uh, a perfect fourth, so from D to F, and then it opens up again to a tritone from the famous C-sharp to G that we heard at the very beginning of the piece. So we remember we talked about that, that chromatic stepwise motion from G-sharp from, sorry, from C sharp up to G, and we again we see that at the very end of the section, and I'm I'm sure that that is not a coincidence. This is a, a gesture that that sort of signals the fact that we are coming back for full circle. We are coming back to the uh, the state that we began the piece with. Now that's a remarkable thing in the context of this work, because generally speaking, the the note aggregates and the chords that we hear 
don't return. Once they are spent, they are spent, they are gone for good, and we move on to the next one. Nevertheless, there is this very subtle sort of recall of something that had happened at an earlier point of the piece. Now, we have a, a brief intervening episode that still uses um, some of the pitches that we heard earlier with these the sequence of dyads where the, the interval is gradually opening up from a minor third to a tritone and but it's much more widely spaced and it's it's sort of like a central axis of a of a symmetrical movement in the in the piece and then the same interval sequence so minor third perfect fourth tritone but with different pitches occurs at the end of this sequence so it's it's very beautiful sort of classical voice leading in a sense, obviously not with classical harmony, but observing the sort of principles of, of counterpoint and voice leading in a, in a rather beautiful way. So even though this piece uh, uses basically a, a rather personal, invented harmonic language, and certainly does not refer to any form of functional harmony or tonality. Nevertheless, Verhez is a master craftsman, and he knows how to write chords. He knows how to uh, how to how to space out his voices, how to connect from one note to another, and he does it masterfully throughout. So that's about it for my harmonic analysis, and let's just have a quick conclusion here. So as I mentioned at the outset of my analysis of the harmony in Désert, there is no apparent overall master logic to the way Verez writes his chords. He freely uses a lot of different techniques. He uses these, these symmetrical mirror chords. He uses 12-note uh, static fields. He uses chords that are built out of stacked intervals and so on and so forth. And he freely allows himself to use octave displacements and octave doublings. So this has absolutely nothing to do with the, the sort of dominant techniques and, and theories of musical composition at the time. And you can certainly tell that Verhez is inventing this himself, and he's inventing it according to his own personal system. So that's a, a remarkable thing in terms of the context of the period, where composers were very, very preoccupied with, with creating rather strict grammars in order to navigate the apparent chaos and lack of hierarchy that exists when you have a totally chromatic harmonic language. Verez takes another another approach, which is that he, he's not using a strict grammar, but nevertheless he has certainly a, a very strong sensibility and he has sort of invented an arsenal of personal techniques for constructing harmonies that suits his material very well. Now, um, the other point I wanted to make is that the harmony throughout this piece basically is non-directional. So it's true that on a local scale you often do have um, movements that are very carefully calibrated from one register to another and he, he often has this chromatic stepwise motion upwards and so on, but that happens on a relatively small scale, so it'll happen over the course of a few bars, but you don't really have harmonic directionality that operates on a larger scale than that, so you don't have entire sections of the piece that gradually progress from the low register and, and move up to the high register and so on and so forth. You don't really have that. You have these sort of blocks and they, they succeed each other without too much in the way of transition and we're just sort of constantly moving from one harmonic state to another uh, at varying speeds depending on on the harmonic rhythm of the section in question. But there's no overall uh, dramaturgy or, or movement really in the harmony. So this is basically a static world from that point of view. I think that Varese basically conceived of his harmony as, as being points in space. I think he thought of it in an almost sort of geometrical sense in terms of the, 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 the spacings of his chords, the, the way that uh, the way that you will gradually open up or contract the, the harmonic space. He, he thought of it almost as a, as a geometer might have thought of harmony. It's, it's very interesting and it is completely different again from, from functional harmony or from any of the, the sort of the very highly technical uh, uh, grammar based um, uh, musical techniques that were being elaborated in the 1950s by the younger generation by composers like Boulez, Stockhausen, Moderna, and Luigi Nono, and so on. <laughs>
Now again, it's very, very difficult and, and probably not a wise idea to separate the harmony from the other parameters in this piece. Again, when, when Verez writes a, a major third, the major third has sense and meaning because he is using the instruments in a very specific register and he's using very, very specific instruments that have certain qualities in that register. So for example, the, the example I gave earlier of the timpani chord where he has a major third D flat and F played in sort of the middle register of the timpani drums, well that object would be completely different if you took that major third and had it an octave lower or uh, or a fifth higher or something, I mean, the, the sound quality of it would be would be totally, totally different. So again, these, these intervals and these harmonies make sense really only in relation to a very specific use of timbre and a specific use of dynamics throughout the piece. So it's it's useful and it's and it's instructive to make these sort of harmonic reductions just to get a sense of how his language works in that sense, but at the end of the day you have to return to the score and you have to listen to it and you have to you have to really feel the direct physical impact of this music so absolutely nothing can replace that and I would strongly encourage anyone uh, to hear a live performance if you can of this work it's an amazing experience and this is a, a great great work <laughs>